Lee Sander is the executive director and CEO of the MTA. He has a long and impressive resume in public transportation policy and management in the public sector and in the private sector. Mr. Sander is a former New York City Transportation Commissioner, a former executive at the New York State Department of Transportation. The New York has worked for New York City Transit and the New York State Division of Housing and Community Renewal. He is the founder and former director of the Rudin Center for Transportation Policy and Management at NYU. He was born and raised in Queens, went to New York City Public Schools, as most of you did, and now lives just down the road in Douglaston. We thank Mr. Sander for being with us today, and I also want to thank Mr. Howard Roberts, who is here today, who is the president of the MTA. And now, Mr. Sander, please. Thank you, uh, Professor. I also want to uh, introduce Joe Smith, uh, who is the uh, president of Long Island Bus, an MTA bus, and the senior bus uh, official uh, for, uh, for the MTA. Uh, I also... Um, I'm an adjunct assistant professor at NYU at the Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. So if I go into professorial mode, you will excuse me. Uh, but we don't have any pop quizzes here and, uh, and uh, no uh, term assignments for this afternoon. But it's great to uh, be here. As the professor uh, said, I'm a uh, graduate of PS 131 and uh, Ryan Junior High School and Jamaica High School. Anybody graduate from Jamaica here? Okay, this is more Bayside, uh, Cardoza, I imagine. Where, where did some of the folks graduate uh, from high school uh, here? Bayside? <coughs> Francis Lewis. Okay. Oh, Van Buren. Where else? Forest Hills. Okay, good. Hillcrest, anybody from Hillcrest? Okay, good. So anyway, I know the territory. So we're here uh, today to talk about uh, the MTA. And... Um, the uh, type for uh, some of my notes here is a little small, so I'm going to be leaning down a little bit. But thank you all for taking the time uh, here uh, to uh, be here. Uh, what we're going to do is talk about uh, the MTA, uh, which, uh, as the professor uh, was saying, moves 8.5 million people uh, around uh, the region uh, each day and uh, is so incredibly vital uh, to our economy. Uh, and to uh, the environment. Just curious, do any of you have any uh, friends or relatives who work for uh, the MTA for New York City Transit, uh, Long Island Railroad, uh, any folks here? Because that would not be surprising. Great, great, great. Well, give my regards uh, to them. So we are, the MTA is the largest public sector, um, largest public transportation uh, agency in the uh, world. Uh, New York, as it exists, uh, would uh, not... Um, be there uh, were it not for the MTA. That's Wall Street, Broadway, the fashion industry. Uh, basically, New York's ascendancy as the global capital of the world is tied directly to transportation. New York began because of its port in the 1700s. Then, when we did the Erie Canal and opened up New York to the uh, to the uh, uh, basically to the areas west near the Great Lakes and then our airport system, and then probably most importantly, our subway system, commuter rail system, that has enabled uh, New York to uh, be uh, what it is. And also uh, related uh, specifically to our being here at Queensborough Community College, uh, New York actually is a bigger center for higher education than Boston, uh, than Washington, where I went to uh, school. And again, there is a direct relationship uh, from our perspective in terms of CUNY, the Board of Higher Education, uh, the other schools, uh, St. John's, NYU, Columbia. Uh, we would not be the center of higher education were it not for this extraordinary transportation uh, system. And this system, you know, it's very relevant for you here because you're very young. Um, and what occurred uh, in the 70s and 80s is that the system basically was on its knees. If we could uh, flip Joe. Was anyone, any of you remember any of this? I mean, I think, okay, some of you do. <laughs> Did any of you ever get stuck when you were a little kid in some of the subways when they're like breaking down every day? Any of you ever have that experience? Well, that's, that's, that's um, where we were. 
Um, it was um, an extraordinary uh, period. Uh, I was in the uh, 1980s, uh, the general manager running the bus system in Manhattan, basically I think in my fourth or fifth month, the second floor of that bus depot where we run service out of, um, uh, out of uh, there uh, for the uh, Lexington Avenue subway line and the 86th Street and 79th Street uh, um, uh, bus lines for the uh, Lexington Avenue and 3rd Avenue bus line and uh, 79th and 86th Street. Um, that floor, that second floor, collapsed at night, and we had to run all that bus service in the middle of the winter from a pier on the Harlem River, moving, it was in excess of about 100,000 people a day uh, from that location. And we had subsequent uh, physical failures. Another bus depot we had, 54th Street, had a similar physical collapse. The system was literally falling apart, and many people associated uh, the, uh, pre, uh, the uh, projected demise of New York, they associated with the uh, demise of our transit system. It was a kind of direct relationship. Psychologically, as New York saw this, um, they um, felt that uh, the future of New York as a great city uh, was uh, deeply uh, in peril. What occurred in 1982 was that um, a, a great public servant, uh, Dick Ravitch, uh, who was chairman and CEO of that time, with the support of the uh, governor and the uh, legislature, uh, began uh, investing in our system uh, as a result of the actions that uh, were taken at his time. And then moving forward, we've invested about $75 billion uh, in the system. And that is why we have a system uh, that looks uh, like it is today. It is a system that is performing better than ever um, in, the, uh, in the numbers and the, I think you said you, uh, was a professor, this is a man, you have a management class here. Uh, and I, I heard there were some other classes that uh, were uh, in this. Organization and management classes right. and marketing classes. Great, so it's very relevant to what you're studying. And um, in terms of how we measure our business, there are a couple of performance indicators, measurements uh, that uh, we use. Uh, the ones uh, that are most important both to us and to our customers our on-time performance and mechanical reliability. The on-time perform on performance and mechanical reliability uh, of our commuter rail system, Metro North, Long Island Railroad. Any of you take Long Island Railroad out here? Okay, not too many, but some. Um, in any event, um, uh, the mechanical reliability and on-time performance of Metro North and Long Island Railroad are the best they've ever been. On the bus side, uh, we have had record um, uh, mechanical performance for the old city private bus lines, which, uh, as this is in Queens, you are familiar with the old Queens uh, Triborough Command uh, Jamaica bus lines are now our MTA bus company, the best mechanical reliability we've ever had. In terms of the New York City Transit bus, also those uh, blue and white buses, um, the fleet is the oldest it's been in 12 years but proportionate to that extraordinarily high mechanical reliability and the best the system has ever had in the month of uh, August. And on the subway side, um, our mechanical reliability, again, the indicator we call is mean distance between failure, um, that is still the best in the country. We saw a little bit of a decline from 2004 um, by about 10, 20 percent due to the increased age of our equipment and also because we took some budget cuts from 2004 that impacted it. Uh, we're confident we're gonna get that back up, but it still remains the best in the country. We were in the range of 4,000, 5,000 uh, miles, mean distance between failure. We're now in the range of 139,000, 140,000. So it is in, the system has just come, and, and you know, no graffiti. We have a little bit of scratch sheety on the subway cars, um, but no graffiti, and it just is unbelievable uh, contrast to where we were. 25 years ago. I like to call it uh, probably the most finest organizational turnaround in the public sector. I don't know if you cover turnarounds uh, in your class, but uh, probably the finest organizational turnaround from an organization that was down here and then up to here in the uh, last uh, 25 years. And so we are immensely uh, proud uh, of it. Let me briefly talk about um, the uh, money. Um, there is a perception because our ridership has increased and we're extraordinarily proud of our ridership. Because of this impressive uh, turnaround, uh, our ridership increased by 40 percent 
over the last 10 years. And then with the increase in gas prices, basically since early this past year, it's gone up another 5% on the um, commuter rail lines, uh, roughly, I think, 3% on the uh, subway side and uh, bus side, but um, 2 to 3% uh, on, on that side. And so there's a perception that we're flush with money. And the way that, um, uh, because New York real estate boomed, um, in the early 2000s, up until last year, because we got a lot of money from real estate tax, we um, did uh, very well in terms of real estate, real estate uh, tax revenue. Unfortunately, now, with what's happened with Wall Street uh, and real estate, that is tanking. And um, we are, another key point to this, um, the fares that you pay with your Metro card. How many of you have Metro cards, by the way? Good, good. How many of you take the system kind of like every day to get here? Okay, so you really should be somewhat interested in what I'm saying here. <laughs> A couple of you open the suggestions and, uh, and recommendations when we're done. Um, but you only cover half of uh, what it costs to run the system. And unfortunately, in 2000, um, the governor and the legislature decided to borrow about in the range of 10 to 15 billion dollars uh, to pay for the equipment that we are now getting. They didn't give us real hard money, we borrowed it. And so as a consequence, we, are, we, are, we have essentially this huge mortgage and we don't have the money to uh, pay for it. And so, good. So what we are now seeing as a consequence of what happened in Wall Street and the bubble bursting is our taxes going down. And um, we also have in our family MTA bridges and tunnels. And by know what MTA bridges and tunnels are, I'm going to go professor, professor, professorial mode. What's MTA bridges and tunnels? Anybody know any facilities, MTA bridges and tunnels? Throg's Neck Bridge, Whitestone Bridge, sound familiar? Right, right. And so how much is class participation in the grade? <laughs> Good. Okay. So our tolls have gone down 4% because of the gas price. But I was just mentioning debt service. That's what I was referring to in terms of the money that basically Albany made us pay, borrow all this money so we get those new subway cars and commuter rail cars. Our debt service costs in the uh, middle of um, in the middle of the 1990s was about $200 million. Uh, it, w it climbed to about $800 million about a year or two ago. But because of the ma that massive amount that was borrowed in the early 2000s, our debt service is going to go from about $800 million to $2 billion. So I have this operating gap of a $1 billion because we had to borrow all this money. And the elected officials now openly say, we're sorry, we made a mistake. And that is on record. The uh, chairman of the Assembly Cooperations Committee, there is a committee called the Cooperations Committee uh, that oversees the MTA public authorities. And Richard Brodsky, the chairman of that committee, has now publicly said, you know, we are at fault. We made a mistake. We have to fix it. And we could not agree more. Basically, in the area of pensions and health care, we've done a pretty good job in keeping our costs down. And basically, the MTA has kept its costs down to the rate of inflation over the past uh, several years. <coughs> Next. Again, following the management theme, when I arrived at the uh, MTA in 2000, uh, a year and um, or a year and a half ago, um, there appeared to me seven major areas that I needed to focus on to move the organization forward to even better performance. While there's no question that the, the MTA has been an extraordinary turnaround, uh, in the, um, uh, by any, you know, any uh, context, whether the public sector, any organization, there were still areas that needed to be focused on. And these uh, are the areas that we focused on, having a stronger culture, a commitment to our employees, so they're more motivated, uh, so that we're listening to them more. Any organization in the 21st century that is not emphasizing the importance of its people and getting the most out of them is going to fail. Uh, financial stability, which is basically the theme of this class presentation. Projects and planning, we anticipate 
a million more people in New York City over the next 25, 30 years, three million more in the uh, region, and that's why we have to expand our system. We have massive overcrowding on the Hillside Avenue, Queens Boulevard line, which I know many of you are familiar with, with the E and the V uh, and the F, um, and uh, similarly in Manhattan. Any of you ever take the Lexington Avenue subway, the four, five, or six? Anybody take that? Anybody ever taken a rush hour? Not pleasant, right? There's no way New York can go into the future with that, which is why we need the Second Avenue subway. And we're also bringing um, the Long Island Railroad into, Penn, into Grand Central. It's called East Side Access. That's critical. And so uh, we are advancing that agenda. Institute transformation. Uh, the MTA has been uh, what we call a very siloed uh, organization, perhaps Professor Garfunkel at some point can describe what a, a siloed organization is as opposed to an integrated uh, organization. But we have these seven agencies, and there's a lot of redundancy, duplication uh, with them, particularly in administrative back office functions. And so we have created an entity called MTA Business Service Center where they will be providing administrative support for all of the agencies. And we anticipate reducing the number of administrative positions, uh, uh, not through layoffs, but through attrition, from 620 to 370 over the next, you know, basically three years. Uh, we also have, we also uh, had three separate bus companies. The biggest piece, which was New York City Transit Bus, Long Island Bus, those of you, I mean, you've all seen it have seen Long Island bus, the red and blue buses that basically come out of Flushing, that come out of Jamaica, Northern Boulevard. You've seen uh, Long Island bus. And you take Long Island bus, by the way? OK, great. Um, and so that was a separate entity. And then, as I mentioned, the former city privates. Again, Triborough, Queens, uh, Jamaica, Command, and um, the ones in the Bronx, um, Liberty Lines. Some of you may have seen them when you go in Manhattan. We have now integrated the management, so I have one president for those three companies, not three. We had a lot of redundancy there, and uh, Joe, who I introduced before, uh, runs uh, all of those. Joe also told me before that he once attended this uh, school, so uh, you have uh, something to aspire to. Uh, and uh, sustainability, you know, we uh, share, as many, the importance of being green. Uh, we are terribly concerned about global warming. While trance is probably the most environmentally friendly thing you can do, other than biking and walking, um, there are more things that we can do in addition to the service that we provide in terms of how we operate. And uh, Joe runs the cleanest system uh, that uh, I think exists in the country in terms of our buses now, in terms of what we call our hybrid electric buses and our clean diesels. And then customer service. Customer service has to be our mantra because we're in the customer business. And uh, safety and security, particularly after 9-11, uh, nine, nine that is a very important uh, thing. So we're making you know, great progress along those lines. Then in terms of uh, the capital program, um, Professor, have you covered the difference between operating and capital? OK, so they know that. So you really should give them the quiz after this. Um, see if you've done those required readings. Um, well, our capital program uh, obviously is central to what we do. It is the subway cars, it is the buses, it is the, uh, the uh, train stations, the depots uh, where we service the equipment uh, from. And uh, this uh, diagram, this chart, uh, pie chart, shows how we get 30% of the money from Washington. We're watching the presidential election very carefully. We're watching what uh, Senator Obama's position has been, what Senator McCain's position has been. That's a major factor to us. We have borrowed a lot of money. We still want to do some borrowing. We just don't want to borrow as much as we have been. And we don't want to borrow money uh, unless it's backed up with um, support from Albany. And we have a real issue now in terms of going into the market uh, to uh, borrow money. So you have that. The state and city purport, uh, contribution has decreased over the years proportionately, and that's why I'm putting, I'm working very closely with the governor and the mayor to increase that. And then we have our own funds like advertising uh, and so forth. Next. And so the reason that we show um, this uh, bar chart is, as I was just saying before, the state and city used to be real partners of ours. And it got down to this, which is just totally unacceptable. And this is why a number of people have said that we were abandoned by the state and city. 
Now, there was a strong effort. I also uh, was part of on the business side to have a greater contribution um, uh, in the last plan, but it was in this time period that uh, we ended up having no support, basically, from uh, Albany and uh, from City Hall, and then uh, had to make it up uh, in uh, bonding uh, in uh, particular, but it was bonding without any uh, financial support. In terms of bonding, these numbers are not so dissimilar, they're in range, but there was no revenue backing this up. It was money backing this up, and the state gave us one-eighth of the sales tax in 05 to give us the money for this. They gave us no money for this. It was just essentially refinancing your mortgage with nothing there. Next. Now, this is the point that we try and make, and it's particularly relevant to a class such as yourself, because you're the next generation. And uh, we are apoplectic. We are scared, those of us in the field, in some ways out of our minds, because we see our global competitors, China, India, investing so much more in the infrastructure and ourselves so little. And while it is true that Beijing did not have a subway system until now, and Shanghai the same, and so there's a certain amount of this that you need to do to catch up, they're not just catching up, they're going past us. And unless we change this, we're not going to have the jobs in New York and the kind of prosperity that we've had. And that's what this conversation is really about. It's really not so much about the MTA, it's about whether New York and the rest of our country are going to have the jobs and the economy uh, to support ourselves. Okay, next. So, to, um, to conclude, the reason that I'm doing this, um, these events, I did one at Hunter College a couple of weeks ago, uh, doing this one, going out, uh, publicly is to make the point that the future of our region is at stake. And what we're trying to do is sustain the conversation with our elected officials, with the leaders of business and labor to ensure that um, over the next several months, when we are trying to deal with that essentially structural billion to two billion dollar deficit that I described, on the operating side, really driven by the fact we had to borrow all this money from 2000 to 2004. And then on the capital side, our next capital program begins in 2010, generally by laws put together in October of next year, and the conversation's happening now. We need about 25 to $30 billion to just replace subway cars, uh, bus depots, signal systems, we have a signal system from the 1930s. Uh, some of you, um, the location, if you pay attention to shadow traffic or INS or whatever you'll hear, occasionally disruptions due to signal problems. Some of it may be current, but you know, a lot of problems because of the fact the system is old. And also, the fact we have such an old signal system, and the signal system in many ways is like our bloodstream. And so the fact it's so old makes it more difficult, more challenging to fix it. And so there are safety issues in terms of how old the signal system is and the people we have uh, working on it. I also can only move maybe 25 trains an hour with this existing signal system. With the newer system that we've put on the L line, that some of you may see, anybody you take the L train? Anybody ever take the L train? You'll see some of the monitors that tell you when the train is coming. That enables us to increase our capacity by about 20, 30 percent. Again, so important if New York grows. And so just to uh, maintain the signal system, improve it, uh, again, replace the cars, the bus depots, track, we need in the range for New York City Transit, for Howard, for Joe, for the commuter railroads, 20 billion. If you include the signal system in the modern signal system, 21, 22 billion. Uh, that's just to replace the signal system, by the way, for the number seven line and on the Queens Boulevard Hillside Avenue line to do the whole uh, city, to do the, I, the whole rest of the IRT, the rest of the IND, will be more billions. Uh, but that's what we want to do. We want to focus on Queens because we see the population growth in Queens uh, happening uh, there. 
Then, after that $20, $21 billion, we need about $5 billion to complete the first segment of Second Avenue. Anybody familiar with what we're doing with Second Avenue? How many of you know that we're building a new subway on Second Avenue? Just curious. I mean, you're from Queens, so I'm not going to like hold this against you. Um, okay, good. So, um, and that project I was just mentioning, um, two before East Side Access, to complete those two projects is five billion. And then, if we want to do some more things like uh, be, uh, continue Second Avenue past 96th Street to 63rd Street, if we want to go down to Lower Manhattan to help the rebirth, the revitalization of Lower Manhattan, uh, if we want to um, uh, do uh, more um, more improvements. That gets you into the range of 30 billion, and so the public conversation is getting our elected officials, getting the editorial boards, the whole New York community to understand as we approach 2010. Basically, the music begins after the election in November because the legislature is going to come back and decide what kind of investment are we going to make in transportation, in education, which is also very important. By the way, CUNY is an extraordinary turnaround itself, and very proud of someone who actually I was an intern at the Board of Higher Education when I was uh, at Jamaica High School. I spent half a year there, very proud, and I've had a lot of involvement with CUNY, of which you're an important part of, and familiar with Queensboro uh, as well specifically, so very proud of that. But as the, as the elected officials, as our community decides what kind of investment we're going to make in terms of transportation, education, health, and so on, um, it is important that we remind New Yorkers how much is at stake and that if we don't uh, get this level of investment, we're going to go back to those pictures that I showed you more or less over a period of time. So um, I hope this has uh, been helpful to you. I appreciate the opportunity. I hope it aligns with what you're uh, studying in your class and open to uh, uh, any questions uh, or comments that you might have. Sir. Howard, would you like to uh, answer why there's no air conditioning in the uh, subways? Should we ask the gentleman how often he takes the uh, subways? Yeah, uh, I probably have a fairly good uh, idea which lines you, uh, you ride. Uh, we have been making, uh, since I got here, a major, major push to uh, get the air conditioning uh, working on all subway cars. We send uh, people out uh, on a daily basis, actually not on a daily basis, we only send them out when it's 85 degrees or above. They go out and they tell us uh, which cars they have uh, temperature guns, they step on the car, they take uh, the temperature in three places in the car and then they report it. Uh, in 2007 we were at about 94%. Uh, this, this last air conditioning season, we've gotten up to 98, and we want to go uh, higher than that. Now, the air conditioning works a lot better on the new cars than it does on the older cars. And our real, our, our real struggle are with the cars that came on the system, uh, uh, you know, 40 uh, years ago, 38 uh, and 40 years ago. That doesn't mean we accept poor performance uh, on those cars. That means we work extra hard on them. Now, we took a real pounding uh, this summer, as far as I'm concerned, particularly on the E and the F. Uh, and we are, uh, we are going to do a lot better uh, next year. But I, I bring in all the barn chiefs who are responsible for those cars and the people who have had the best performance on a set of cars get a star that they get to put on their uh, on their desk. The people who had the worst performance get a big thermometer. It's about this big. It sits right on the superintendent's desk, okay? And the person who audits that makes it, they're not allowed to take those thermometers off until they get their performance up and the thermometer goes to somebody else. And the person that audits that is me. If I walk in that bar and that thermometer isn't there, there's a good chance the bar chief isn't going to be there by the end of the uh, of the day. So we take it very, very seriously. Now, what I was really talking about was the uh, station. Ah, uh, stations. I would love to uh, to have air conditioning stations. Unfortunately, 
uh, that uh, with the capital constraints that Lee's talking about, that's going to be someday, but that someday I'm probably not going to be here. <laughs> I mean, that, and a, a lot of, you know, in a lot of cases, not only do we not have air conditioning, we don't even have good airflow, which would least help. And, they, and, and some, a lot of the stations, the only thing that moves the air is when the train comes down the tunnel and you feel just a little bit of breeze until it uh, comes in the, uh, in the station. Yeah, we would love to do it. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that you'll find, and I know this is not public administration, this is management and organization, is I'm sure your class has more of a, a private sector orientation. But when you're in the public sector, you have to prioritize. There's no question that we would love to have air conditioned stations and to mo do more than what we have. What I need to do, what we need to do, is within the funding envelope that we're given by the governor, the mayor, the legislature, and also being as efficient as we can in what we're doing. Um, do as much as we can. And so while it would be great to do that, uh, given what we've got, we have to uh, do the most we can. Do we, with, do we with, the, with the economic crisis that we're facing here in New York, do you feel that you guys will still be raising the fares like, you, like it has been, you guys been doing? Let me, just, let me just say this. I mean, I, philosophically, I believe that we should increase the fares at the rate of inflation, uh, not more, not less. Um, uh, unfortunately, if uh, the legislature and the governor uh, are not able to provide more funding, we will have no choice but to either increase the fares or reduce service. I've already cut my budget uh, from 2004 to 2007 by, uh, by 5%, and I'm committed to cutting another 6%. So we will have taken, over this period of time, um, over 11% of cutting our budget. And that's at the same time as our ridership has increased by 40%. And while some of that increased ridership is not an additional workload to our people, some of it is. I mean, some of it just results in more crowding on trains, but there is more refuse deposited. There's more a demand on cleaning. And so we're trying to do everything that we can to reduce that, uh, to reduce our expenses and to be as efficient as I can. As I said, we've kept our um, expenses with the exception of security and high-tech stuff, roughly the rate of inflation at 3%. So in terms of fares and tolls, we increased them um, by 3.85% uh, last year. Um, it depends upon how much money uh, we're able to uh, get in assistance uh, for us. I should point out, however, though, uh, by the way, how many of you have uh, monthly uh, Metro cards? Okay, how many of you have biweekly? Okay, we just started that. Uh, uh, how many of you have weekly? Uh, how many of you don't have um, any Metro cards and just pay by the day? Okay, that's representative of the numbers that we see. For folks who have discounts, the average fare by ride is about somewhere between $1.30 to $1.50. Uh, that's less than what the fare was in 1995. So from a policy standpoint, I would love to make it even lower and I'm happy with where it is now. I think that that has resulted in great economic benefit uh, to New York by making it cheap. I think it's resulted in more um, uh, retail activity and, um, and been good for the environment, people taking trains rather than cars. But it's important to point out that there aren't too many commodities where you all are paying less than you uh, paid 10 years ago. And I do want to make that point in terms of you know, MTA credibility and, and what we've done. You know, we, we often get criticized, which is fair with a large organization, you know, there are always going to be some things that we could do a little better. But part of my job is also to emphasize in forums like these to say that, you know, in addition to the fact the system is operating overall better than it has been, that what we're doing for you is better than we did 10 years ago. So I have two main questions, basically. Got it. Um, I am unbelievably confident in the MTA 
I think when you look at where the MTA was in the early 80s, and we showed you the pictures, and where we are now with, even though we've dipped on our mean distance between failure on the subway side by 10, 20 percent, and, and I think we're going to be able to turn that around, it's still probably the best in the country, and that's our weakest performance indicator, roughly. On-time performance has gone down a little bit, and that's primarily because of the overcrowding and the track work. But in terms of mechanical reliability, we're off the charts. And so when you look at this performance with our ridership, we're, we're, we can deliver, and we have delivered. It's not like we haven't delivered. This is, again, this tremendous change from the 70s and 80s to now. And I believe, with the financial support uh, from uh, the governor and legislature, we can meet those challenges. And the projects that we have lined up, like Second Avenue, like East Side Access, also creating dedicated rights of way on bus lanes, bus rapid transit. We did the first one on Fordham Road um, a couple of months ago, the BX12. You may not be as familiar coming from Queen. Anybody from the Bronx here? I would tend not to think. I would tend. Okay, good. Um, grew up. Well, anyway, Fordham Road is a major artery, very complex, very challenging. Probably one of the most challenging arteries to put something like this on there. We uh, deployed it. Um, a couple of months ago, smashing success. So overall, the MTA has done it and will do it if we have the financial wherewithal. In terms of making the argument to Washington, I did a press conference with Senator Clinton uh, about three weeks ago, uh, calling on the uh, President and Congress to do more. I'm actually going to be doing a press conference at 1 o'clock today at Grand Central uh, with my fellow commissioner from New York City DOT. Uh, Congressman Nadler, who is one of our senior Democrats, the senior Democrat from New York on the House Transportation Infrastructure Committee, calling on Washington in the next federal transportation bill to give us more money. Um, Washington gives us, as you saw, 30 percent. They need to do more. Um, if we're going to get a capital program of 25 to 30 billion, if we get 6 billion now from the feds, that number needs to be higher. New York, Albany, and City Hall cannot, just, cannot do the lifting all by itself. You can't do the lifting all by yourself in terms of what you pay for the Metro card. It's got to be a balance. As far as where your finances come from, um, you said 56% come from MTA revenue. Um, and specifically, 39% come from bus, Long Island Railroad, and Subway. I was just curious as to how much of that is actually Long Island Railroad. Well, the, um, the Long Island Railroad uh, is uh, about 6,000 people. Um, basically, we have a $10.3 billion operating budget. Uh, Howard, you're about seven, six, seven, what's your number? Five, six. Five, six. That's excluding uh, debt service and uh, any associated debt service and health care. That's not including health care. Without the health care and the pension, overall, we're about eight. He's five. Long Island Railroad is probably in the range of 500 to a billion. I forget the exact numbers. They're roughly the same as Metro North, but basically about the same size. 6,000 employees, about 1,000 trains, and they're in the 500 to a um, billion dollar range. The bus system that Joe operates, separate from his New York City Transit responsibilities, is actually bigger individually than Long Island Railroad and uh, uh, Metro North. Um, so they're in that range. And so, in terms of what we call fare box recovery ratio, uh, they meet, I believe, in the range, it's a little lower than New York City Transit, about 40 to 50 cents on the dollar in terms of what Long Island Railroad um, uh, passengers pay for as compared to what we get from subsidy. If you really want to know the exact answer, Joe or Aaron will get that to you or we'll get it to the professor. What can young people do? who within the city of New York rely heavily on buses and subways, and especially as you go out into the working world, you'll experience so much more of that. What can we all do in a grassroots sort of way to impress upon our local legislators just how vital an issue this is for all of us and for our future? What can we do? Well, you can do a lot. Um, and that is the key decision makers are going to be Folks like Frank Padavan, uh, who's, a, who's a friend, uh, who lives, uh, who covers uh, the state senate uh, in this district uh, over here on the assembly uh, side, and Carosa, I believe, uh, covers again where Queensboro is. But um, how many of you are not from Queens? I presume most of you are from Queens. So we have folks who are not from Queens here too. 
Okay, interesting. But wherever you are, I mean, I, what was that? Where is where are some of you from? We're not from Queens. Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Long Island. Long Island. Okay, I mean. The, the individual legis legislators uh, from Queens, from Long Island, whether in the Assembly or in the Senate, are critical. Um, the Speaker of the Assembly, Shelley Silver, and uh, on the uh, Senate, State Senate side, Malcolm Smith, um, uh, on the uh, minority side, uh, Dean Skelos from Rockville Center, uh, Malcolm, Senator Smith, um, uh, is from Southeast Queens. Um, uh, Senator Skelos uh, on the Republican side is from Rockville Center. It's a question after the election whether the Democrats or the Republicans, Republicans have had have had the majority in the state Senate. We'll see whether you know they sustain that position or if it changes a lot of a lot of uh, activity about that. But whoever your state senator or assemblyman is, they should reach out to them. You can reach out to them as a class. You can reach out to them as a group. You can invite them to come here and speak at Queensboro about it. Um, but what you need to do, what we need you to do, is to engage your local elected officials uh, to emphasize how important it is. Um, that will be very important. That's the main reason why I'm, uh, you know, why I'm here. That's what needs to be done. I'm sorry that I have to stop you now, but these students have to have ten minutes to get to the next class. We, we thank you very much for coming and. Uh, Every success in your career. Great. Thank you.